buenos dias, goeiedag, goeiemorgen, bonjour, welkom, bienvenidas, bienvenidos, bienvengudas, soyez les bienvenus, welcome to the Embassy of Spain, to this webinar that we're devoting Fab Science, Science Beyond the Lab. Uh, we're very happy to have you all here with us. We are actually doing this live from the, the Spain Arts and Science Lab in Belgium, this uh, cultural and, and, and science experimental space that we have within the Embassy of, of Spain on Rue de la Science 19 in the heart of the European uh, quarter here in Brussels. And we am very happy to have a, a, a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, science communicators, researchers uh, that are, have joined us today to bring you this webinar that we want to, basically it's a discussion uh, uh, between uh, Belgian and, and, and Spanish science communicators that are devoting their lives, their professions to, to better reach out to people to, to actually help science go beyond the lab and, and, and reach uh, you know, as wide an audience as possible. And we will also uh, have here, as you can see, a, a team of, of, of colleagues that are uh, Jurena, Esther, Jessica, uh, Molina, who in her own right, she's a, a doctor in biology and has prepared this uh, with, uh, with me today. And uh, we will first, after this short introduction, we will ask each of the speakers, I will introduce them uh, uh, one by one when it's their turn to speak. They'll make short presentations. And, um, and then we have uh, questions and we welcome uh, questions from the audience. You can drop them on, on the chat or we will have also a Q&A um, uh, time as well later on, but I encourage you to please uh, uh, be active and participate. In fact, we want you to be active and, and stay with us and, and we would like, we're doing a survey. And this was actually uh, one of our uh, colleagues here, Lisbeth Art uh, ID, and we really uh, thank her for, for it. Uh, we are, we are having a, a series of questions that we're going to throw at you uh, to help us really understand who is, who is on the other side of the screen, how we can do this better uh, now on this occasion. And also because we would like this to be a, a series of, of, of webinars or, uh, or hybrids. I mean, whatever we can manage uh, uh, if, if the pandemic allows to uh, reinforce these networks to bring together people who are doing basically the same thing, you know, devoting their, 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 their creation, their time, um, to, to making science, uh, technology, and innovation more understandable. So the first, in fact, we're going to do a survey. It's going to only take you a few seconds. And we have, uh, you're going to see it on the screen before we start. This is the first two questions we're putting uh, to you. Where are you based? Just click uh, whatever applies and tell us a bit about your profile. Who are you? Are you a scientist? Uh, Former scientist, future scientist, not a scientist. And just take a, a few seconds to please reply and then we'll be on, on our way. Okay. And then we'll be, you'll be able to see the results as, as, we, as we go along and you'll see why we're doing this. I think that's, that pretty much did it. And then I'd like to start right off um, with, uh, with our first uh, guests. Uh, they're all here. You can see them on, on the screen. And we, I would like to welcome Elena Gonzalez Buron and, and Uriol Marimon, who are, you see them right there. They're, we're traveling all the way to Barcelona uh, today to, to be with them. So bear with us. And they represent Big Van Ciencia, which is a nonprofit organization of scientists and researchers that aims to transform scientific communication into attractive activities for all types of audiences through the arts, using drama-based activities, humor, storytelling, etc. They communicate and educate in science. Elena is a biomedical scientist and founder uh, and project coordinator of Big Bang Ciencia. And Uriol Marimon, um, he's a chemist uh, and, and project director of, of Big Bang Ciencia. So without further ado, I would like to ask you, please, Elena and Uriol, benvinguda y benvingut y molt bon dia. And I'd bon like dia. to ask you if you could start out by telling us a bit more about Big Bang Ciencia, about yourselves, what you do, and give us some examples so that we can understand how, 
how you're doing this science uh, communication and education. Thank you so much. And be being good. Be being good. Gracias. Thank you so much. It's Thank a you, Sergi. real pleasure, Sergi, to be here. Feliz San Juan a todos. That's right. Y, <laughs> so thanks for the invitation. And yeah, let's talk a little bit about what is Big Bang Ciencia and who we are. Little uh, small introduction. So I'm Elena Gonzalez. I have a PhD in biomedicine, and together with Uriol Marimón, PhD in organic chemistry, we are founders of Big One Science. It's a company, non-profit company, aimed to communicate and to educate in science uh, to different audiences. The company started like nine years ago. And through all this time, we have been doing science communication into very different formats. But let's say that we want to communicate science using, using mainly storytelling, emotions, humor, so we can somehow move the people with science stories. Um, as I said, we, we have different formats to communicate science. Um, our main format is performing arts. We do theater, we do stand-up comedy, we do clown to communicate science, but we also have other, other kind of formats to, to be able to disseminate and to communicate science. We write books, we, we collaborate with different TV shows, radio, podcasts. We are also active in social networks. But what we would like to talk today is about our educational projects. So how can we go inside the school um, to, let's say, to develop um, innovative science education projects in which we can convert somehow the students, we work with primary and secondary students, into real science communicators. So this is what we want to talk a little bit about today. Um, our, our projects are formal and non-formal education. Um, so we go inside the school, but we also have other kind of projects outside the school. Normally what we do is to do a uh, research about how can we, how can we impact with science to these teenagers or with these primary school kids. So through mainly European projects, research European projects, we're able to do this focus group inside the schools to understand what are the fears, what are the barriers, what are the, 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 yeah, the, stereotypes. the, the stereotypes, all these things that the teenagers and the primary school kids have, mostly teenagers, because the main <laughs> barriers um, towards science are normally in high school, but yeah, we, we try to understand what are, what are, what, what is in their minds and try to, with all this knowledge, uh, innovate in the way that we can communicate and educate through science. So through this research project, and I can name some of them, for example, Perform, Creations, Baluard, Other. We have been part of, of different European projects. Through these projects, we can understand what is in their mind, and we can somehow start prototyping the activities, uh, implementing, and extract results from it. So is this activity working better is this other project maybe uh, more meaningful for the teenagers? Um, so all the projects have some common things. All the projects that we implement inside the classroom have, have common things. In all of them, we try to convert the teenagers or the, or the kids into science communicators. So we love when, when kids can decide the science that they are going to communicate and become real communicators to disseminate science to other people, not only inside the school, but also in their neighborhoods. This is one of the main common things. So we also give them the autonomy to decide what kind of science they are going to explain. And we also bring real scientists inside the school. I, we, we think 
this is super important, not only because the scientists can explain science firsthand, but also because they serve as, as role models. Normally, teenagers, when, when you ask teenagers, they say that they don't know any scientists. Uh, in fact, their teachers are scientists, but, but they, they normally say that they don't know any scientists, so they have a lot of stereotypes around what is a scientist. So bringing real scientists inside the classroom can break a lot of stereotypes, social and gender related stereotypes. And other common things that our project has is that we not only teach about scientific concepts, but we also want to train them into other values related with, with science as critical thinking, gender issues in science, ethics, um, so, yeah, doing this European yeah. project, we can the research. The human dimension of so science is bringing inside the school thanks to the participation of this uh, real science. We try to find young scientists, PhD or postdoc uh, people, and we train these scientists to allow them or to give them the tools to have conversations with uh, secondary school students in order to talk about this uh, human dimension of science, that uh, scientists talk about their fears, they, they pervert things in the lab, but also in the daily life. The, we train them to have these conversations because we consider that this really brings science to the young people. Young people understand that, that to be a scientist is not only do experiments in the lab, but it's also to have a normal life. And yeah, it breaks the, these stereotypes and these barriers for the, for the young people. Can I ask you a quick question just to, to, to follow, because I, I think humor is very important to your work. And I wanted to ask you, how do you use humor in a way that doesn't take away from the, also the relevance or the, of the seriousness of, of, of the scientific fact. No? How, how do you use that? And if you can give us some examples of, of, how, of how you work uh, and use humor uh, you know, to, to get your message across, please. Yeah, this is important. We all, uh, as Elena said, we use uh, artistic approach. approach. We use uh, arts and non-formal education to generate this dialogue between young people and scientists, uh, science communicators that come from DIGPAN or other uh, researchers that we bring from the universities and labs inside the class. And when we use uh, humor, we can create this uh, dialogue uh, on equals because normally students see the researchers and the scientists as uh, super clever people that it's working in their labs, doing uh, nerd things that and are- even, even even speaking a language that they, are, they don't understand. So when we use humor, we, we, we can engage much better with, mm -hmm. with teenagers. And yes, we also train other scientists on how to use humor is true that it's tricky because the most important thing when we do a science communication and we do believe that the most important thing is the science so the scientific knowledge of course you can add some humor into this science communication but you can never uh, put the humor or set the humor um, over the scientific mm -hmm. knowledge what we use, what we try to use is to create some narratives that are close to the scientific concepts that we want to bring to the students. But these narratives comes from the real life of the people. So we look for the YouTubers that the young people see. We look for what they do. We try to understand which are their uh, role models like important people that come from the sports or or from the mass culture singers this kind of things in tv programs and we do the humor with this part of the of their life and when we use humor and we catch their attention and we are at the same level to start this dialogue this conversation is when we start to talk about science 
because they consider us one more of their of their group and we can start to talk about these other these other topics mm-hmm. so this is one of the powerful things that humor brings to to us to communicate and to educate in science and in fact when you use humor and they talk to you as a friend more as a someone that came here to talk about science they can ask quite a lot of things about science that you know is is mm-hmm. is like as as long as you are a scientist and you are also my friend uh can you explain me a little bit about so so you you can engage much better with them okay. and can you perhaps give us an example a quick because you do this in catalan or spanish perhaps maybe yes. English, it doesn't work but do you can you think of a specific <laughs> we prepare instance or what you've used humor or an anecdote that you can share with us that you've had in the classroom that where humor helped you to you know break through yeah for example <laughs> uh i come from the field of uh, genetics and i also explain well i love to explain uh, genetic engineering and transgenic and a lot of times i explain transgenic using superheroes because in the films they say that superheroes are mutants but in fact they are transgenic people okay. for example Wolverine Wolverine what uh, Wolverine is a transgenic guy mm-hmm. so you have to take the DNA of Wolverine make a cut and put them genes off and normally mm-hmm. people say well no be careful because the name is a little bit tricky but there are no genes of wolf there are genes of lizard because Wolverine mm-hmm. can regenerate the tissues so lizards also can regenerate the tissues so the name shouldn't be Wolverine but maybe lizard Wolverine is that but but uh, it's not catchy so it's very, much more better Wolverine mm-hmm. and with yeah. this kind of I have jokes, a son I'm going to try this on my son who loves uh, Wolverine I'm going to try this transgenic thing I'm going to really try uh, yeah 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 this is really good so listen and if people want to know more they can go to your website no big van ciencia yes. you can bigvanciencia.com big 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 you can write it on the on the chat so listen if you agree because we'll stay on the conversation we'll we're going to move on to 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 some of the other colleagues but we'll we'll come back to you later is that okay sure. so stay on with us thank you so much and now we are traveling back uh, north to this to our neck of the woods where we are now and we are we're coming back to belgium and i'm very very happy to introduce two uh people that have uh you know we've been in contact all of us uh preparing for this uh, webinar and it's already been very rewarding and i want to thank them again for the time they've already dedicated you know to to preparing and uh and i we didn't know it's it's also been good because be, besides the presentation we're putting together today we our purpose uh with this webinar is to also create networks to so the people th- those of you who who are, who are, are with us today uh, can learn more about who is doing what and that we you can be in direct contact you know you this is uh, uh, also the purpose of this of this uh, session so we have now a a soapbox science which is a very very interesting initiative uh, is a novel public outreach platform soapbox science for promoting women and non-binary scientists and the science they do their events transform public areas into an arena for public learning and scientific debate they follow the format of the london hyde park's speakers corner you will remember the speakers corner uh, which is a historically an arena for public debate in fact not, i used to have a boss when i first entered the diplomatic career who before we complained or said anything he had a, a stool because that's what happens they have a stool in the middle of the park and you can stand on the stool and then criticize the the king or the queen that's the origin of it so my boss thought that you know so he would have a stand on the on the box so that's the spirit of uh, of uh, soapbox science to really signal out a space where people are safe uh to express uh, their beliefs sometimes in context where that's not always uh, easy to do and and to explain what this is we have uh, uh with us Arianna Pichali who is a physicist at the Royal Belgian Institute for Space Aeronomy and coordinator of uh, Sobok Science Brussels and we have also uh, a a physicist Christine uh, Bingen 
uh, which is also at the Royal Belgian Institute for Space Aeronomy, and she's also coordinator of, of this wonderful initiative. And so, uh, Arianna, bienvenuta, Christine, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Please uh, take it away. Tell us about Soapbox Science. Tell us about yourselves and give us some examples of what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for the very interesting uh, uh, session. It's really wonderful to be there. Uh, so uh, to be there to speak about uh, our initiative, the Sobot Science uh, Brussels Initiative. And so as you rightly mentioned, Sobot Science is an initiative of promotion of women and non-binary people in science that was created in London in 2011 on the model of, um, of uh, uh, the speaker's corner in Hyde Park. So you, you have seen here this uh, display, a historical picture where, with where anybody, as you mentioned, can just uh, uh, take the floor about any kind of, uh, of debate. And so, so both sides is mimics this uh, kind of even to, uh, prom to address the problem of gender inequalities in science. And so here, this is a typical picture of a so both sides event. Well, you see the main ingredient that you have here, the researcher, um, uh, which is, uh, who is uh, identified by her lab code, and she's explaining to the, to the passersby her research topic from a small uh, podium, her soapbox. Uh, <laughs> and so, yes, uh, what's uh, the purpose of soapbox science? Well, as you know, uh, statistics show that girls find less easily their way uh, to stand su studies than boys, and that the percentage of women drops at uh, all stages of the scientific career. And this phenomenon is uh, finds its origin in the many implicit gender bias present in the society and affecting uh, actually all of us. And these bias are very difficult to detect because they are part of our life and of our norms. And so, for instance, what's the image of a scientist conveyed by our society? Well, if I have a look at the library of my kids, uh, I find, for instance, this kind of character here, uh, Professor Gobelin, who is a scientist. He is, as you can see, uh, an old blank man. He's unmarried and he's extremely uh, uh, distracted. Then uh, you have also, you know, Tata, Tintin, uh, with the character of uh, Professor Tournesol, probably you know, uh, who is again a scientist. Uh, also very distracted, a dirty a man, a choleric man. And so, well, this is the, the image we have in our society about some scientists. And it is exactly the object of Sobot Science to provide other role models like, like you in the big fan sense, yes, eh? uh, to, uh, well, to, to counteract this perception of, of the scientist. Note that uh, having more women in, women in science is not only a matter of justice, but studies also show that a good gender balance increases the creativity and the quality of the work of a science uh, team, not only in academia, but in business in general. And I like to give the example of my daughter's lab where there is a quite good gender balance about 40, 60 person. And this is really a top lab in the field of uh, biotech. And finally, a, a, a last reflection uh, to these challenges, such as, for instance, climate change, are very complex uh, challenges. 
And since the perception of a problem differs on average between genders, the fact to improve gender balance and more generally the diversity and the inclusiveness in science is very important to address such kind of uh, complex uh, challenges in an appropriate way. So now I will give the floor to Ariana so that she can speak more specifically about the Belgian aspect of social science. Ariana, I give you the floor. Oh, thank you, Christine. Thank you to everyone. Hello, good morning, and thanks for uh, all. <laughs> Buenos dias. Gracias por la invitación. Um, so, Soapbox Science Brussels, how it, it was born? It was born a bit by chance, by like often nice things are always born. So, uh, I was a few years ago at the conference and I was speaking with the colleagues. And, uh, and they proposed it. They, it was one of the organizers of Soapbox Science Berlin and, and introduced me the concept and said, Why you don't? do organize something similar in, in Brussels. And then I came back to Brussels and I spoke with my colleagues from uh, the Belgian Institute for Space Aeronomy and uh, from uh, the Royal Observatory of Belgium. And, uh, and here we are today, it's not a very nice picture, but uh, these are the six organizer today of, uh, from the two institutes also box signs. In the link I added, uh, you can find more information about our team. So the first box signs Brussels events was in, organized in 2019. Uh, we were quite at the beginning uh, very inexperienced, and, but nevertheless we managed to obtain about uh, more than 20 applications for the first call of uh, women and non-binary scientists. And the idea was to bring into an event at the end of June 2020. But then, of course, the, so the, the COVID-19 arrived and changed all our plan. So first, we have to postpone the event to, to September 2020, beginning of October. We were still hoping to have a live event, and then we realized that that was not possible and we had to completely change the format. So normally, Soapbox Science event, it's very interactive. The idea is really to bring science in a place where people are not expecting science. So for example, uh, uh, in, in a street full of uh, shopping or in, on the beach, really unusual place where you find science. And so we, we wanted to do something similar, even if it was an online and virtual event. And for this reason, we tried to recreate in our institute the kind of lounge. So uh, the speaker and uh, one of the organizer could sit together and have a discussion about the scientific topic of, uh, of the organizer, of, of, this, of the speaker and of the researcher. And, uh, and at the same time, the, the, the event, the discussion was broadcasted uh, on all social media like Facebook and, uh, uh, and YouTube. And uh, it was the possibility also to chat and to ask questions. So even if the situation was not the best, we would manage, however, to have a, a, a nice interactive uh, atmosphere. And then this year, we started again with a new call. This year was quite a success because we obtained uh, more than 60 uh, applications. So it was very difficult to, to select the participants and the speakers because we have normally each sub box event as only 12 speakers that they will speak during three hours. And, uh, and this time of the event will be very soon, actually will be in two days on Saturday, um, plus de la Bourse at Bruxelles at two o'clock. So if you are in Belgium or in Brussels, I strongly invite you to come to see us. We are really now in the middle of the organization and uh, we are very excited to, to have the first live event of our, of our group. So I live with this. And uh, I really hope to see all of you, all you uh, this Saturday. And thank you very much. Okay. I added some link. Uh, sorry, I, I, I tried to make a 
by a pace and it was, uh, I thought it was not successful. So there are some duplicate uh, information. I, I, I apologize for this. No. But so you have all the links. We thank you because this is very good information. We will also, uh, that's what networks do. So we, we're happy that, that you inform us about this because we will also circulate this information uh, Thank amongst you very colleagues. Much. May I ask a couple of questions, please? First, and you'll think maybe this is very basic, but I'm going to take advantage. This is this doesn't always happen. Sometimes we have webinars where we have scientists, like we have today, but these scientists are not science communicators, so we're lucky. Sometimes we have science communicators who are not scientists, no? but in this case, all of you are science communicators. So I wanted to, can you explain briefly, either Ariana or Christine, in your own words, for people who are following us, what does a, a space ironomist, or what does space ironomy do specifically? Uh, do it in your own, uh, please, uh, soapbox uh, way. Do a uh, uh, small demonstration. How do you would explain to people, lay, lay public, laymen and women, uh, and and perhaps you do different things within this big field. Yeah. So if you can each tell us a little bit, thank you. Okay, uh, I want to miss early terms just to say uh, that we study the atmospheres. And I, 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 I use the, the plural atmospheres because it's not only the Earth's atmosphere, but uh, also the atmosphere of uh, other planets. Yes. Uh, for instance, Ariana is working. Uh, working yes, with uh, atmos. Christine is working with the Earth's atmosphere, and I'm working with uh, the atmosphere of planets on Mars and Venus. And we also study, of course, the interaction between these atmospheres and the sun, the, the emission of the sun, the solar wind and so on, because, of course, the sun is all, all, all drive. I mean, it's, uh, it's what's made in alive, what, what makes us alive. So this is uh, the simple uh, <laughs> meaning of this early world. <laughs> Can you give us an example, please, of, uh, of how this can be applied for, you know, so the people understand, oh, okay, what, what, is it using meteorology or none at all, or is it uh, in, in food production, I don't know, in, in, in forecasting, uh, tell us a little bit, just examples of how, how your science is used uh, um, on, a, on a daily basis. Well, the difference with the meteorology is that, that the meteorology will give the weather today and the, the atmospheric conditions today. And all uh, topic is more to, to understand the things behind this, the physics and the chemistry behind what happens and to try to, uh, to anticipate and to foresee uh, what will happen in the future. And so I would say, I would give a, a, a few applications of our field. It's, for instance, the study of pollution. This is in the, the lower layers of the atmosphere. Uh, pollution, where are they coming from? How are they propagating? What are the consequences? What, are, what is the chemistry behind all this uh, pollution? This is one aspect. Another aspect is, of course, climate. And this is the same, but at a, in, in a longer uh, time scale. So who is it going to evolve and so on? So we are the, the, the researchers. Uh, uh, studying climate change, but in the atmosphere. And, and I will let Ariana yes. uh, yes. let you dream about what she's doing. <laughs> Venus. And, yeah. What we do on, on planets, finally. So we want to understand how planets have evolved, what, what is their future, and also how it is their climate today. And I'm studying Mars and Venus that are two very opposite planets. Mars, it's very, very cold. Venus, it's very, very warm, hot, I will say. And they evolved in two completely different ways. And, and we are trying to understand, so 
why what make them evolve in so different way because they they, they were formed at the same time uh, together with turk and uh, in the from the same ingredients and so what why these planets evolve in so differently one from another and thank you it helps thank us you. to understand our future and our past sure sure and if i may also and you've all talked about gender and we always talk about gender it's it's impossible not to talk about 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 gender in general but specifically when it comes to to science and we've had different webinars on this specifically we commemorate the the international day on on, on women and girls in in science so i'm asking you uh because you know when you were little girls or non binary person growing up how how does a little girl a non binary person ever come to or any person in general to 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 the decision to de devote their their professional life their research to to agronomy how do, how how does one get to that and 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 in your case did gender play a role or not were you able to have the same access uh to this information were you lucky in your in your respective uh schools or universities just give us a bit uh, a feeling about that please I know you, I don't know if you want to answer first, Ayana. Or... From my point of view, I can give you the Italian point of view. I, I, in my family well, was also part scientific family, okay. and they always pushed me. And as a little kid, I wanted to study animals and to be more natural science. And then I was mostly more fascinated by by the astronomy and by the stars and by the sky. And I, I think I was always uh, supported also by school and by uh, high school teachers. They were always very supporting, not only of me, but of all the class I remember. So there was not difference between girl and, and boys from this point of view. Yes, I, I would say uh, about the same. I, I was in the lucky few uh, having uh, the, those role models. My, my mom was a teacher in mathematics and, uh, and she was very, she was actually a physicist. And so she was very, uh, very, uh, she, she felt very good in science. My, my, my father also, he was an engineer and I had these role models and they also encouraged me. So, and this is, I think the reason why we want to share this with people who don't have this chance because we really realize uh, how lucky we are. Thank you so much. A quick question. Is there so box science in in Spain that uh, or are you do you have colleagues in Spain? Not yet. So okay. this is a call. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, you are very welcome. And uh, I would say, uh, like uh, Ariana told our story. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot of support from the from the from the team in in uh, England, so it is very well organized. And so, if you have scientists willing to do this, really, it's uh, it's uh, it's great. Very good. I, I really, we really encourage uh, them to. Excellent. To do so. We will we will make sure we send. We have a network of of, of embassies that are involved in the same uh, science diplom diplomacy program. So we will share this with the network. Uh, and, and thank you so much. We'll come back to you. And now we are traveling, but before we leave Belgium, oh, sorry, they're reminding me, there's one more question that you have here. It's uh, exactly, have you ever taken part in an informal science outreach event in the street, an exhibition at the airport? Because this is a question that was proposed by, by uh, Ariana and Christine, actually, that relating to their presentation. Do you want to know if you know, to get a feeling of, of what this kind of experiences that we have. Because I think it was very interesting what you said about taking things outside the context, you know, and, and, and bringing it to a more, you know, outside the lab, as it were, or the, you know, so that was very interesting. So, okay, I think that uh, we'll give you some time to, to do that. And, and now before we travel, I think we're going to travel back to Spain. But before we do that, I just wanted to tell you when uh, my colleague, Yurena, 
did the walkthrough when we first started the webinar, and I wanted to explain to you a little bit what 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 this was. I already told you we're within uh, this the courtyard where it's an annex of the courtyard of the it's an ancien maison de maître, one of those un palacete, no, a small uh, palace that was typical of this of this uh, neighborhood in in. In, uh, in, in the ancien quartier Leopold, the old quartier Leopold, before it became the European Union quarter with all the big buildings. So it has, it has some, uh, it's a bit of an oasis, if you will. It's just, imagine this uh, older home that was, uh, uh, there's a few of them left in the neighborhood that was built in the, in, at the beginning of the 19th uh, century, in the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, and then you we're surrounded by this huge, uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, of glass and concrete. And then you saw when we were uh, doing the walkthrough, this big mural that's called Butterfly Effect, uh, which in fact, we, it was an attempt of, of some of the things you were saying earlier to, to bring together uh, science, uh, policy, and the arts. And then we, we had this big wall that you saw, this big white wall that was really uh, when I first arrived here, it was like, wow, we have to do something with this white wall. Um, and uh, long story short, uh, and uh, in line with the, with the last COP25 uh, that was uh, held between, you know, in Madrid, but it was a Chilean presidency, uh, we came up with the Ville de Bruxelles, with the city of Brussels. We came up with this uh, idea, this theme that was... Um, you know, a wall to, to do some, to do an artistic public art in, intervention on a wall against climate change. And then we, we did a public call. Uh, we, we, we had over a hundred artists from all over Europe uh, interested. And, and finally, uh, two women, Olympia and, and Esther were selected. Uh, for us, the gender perspective was very important. Uh, as well, and in fact, at the heart of this mural is is uh, is a woman that's somehow having some symbiotic relationship with with nature. And again, we we can all play a role, and it's really wonderful when this comes together. And we all know humor, the arts; uh, these are vehicles that go straight to our veins, no? Uh, and that is uh, really uh, hard to find other sort of uh, of ways to to get this message across so we right right now we have you saw as well in behind me you have some pictures of the of an exhibit we have uh, uh that we inaugurated a few days ago with audience and we had about 50 people so we're happy to get back to normal quote unquote and uh, this is uh, the exhibit you can find more on our website i think uh, my colleagues will drop the the address of the spainculture.be uh, and we so we welcome cultural projects that are, and scientific projects that are socially engaged. Um, we actually work with, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Spain, but particularly for the development agency, Spain's uh, development agency, IFID, for uh, international cooperation, which is the ENABEL, the equivalent of ENABEL in Belgium. And this exhibit, some of pictures you see photographs in the background, it's called Towards the Promised Land, and it's by Robert Astorgano, a young filmmaker and photographer. Uh, so this is some of the things that you can see, you know, that uh, he talks about the, the drama behind uh, uh, the refugee crisis back in 2015, especially, and also the, 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 the flux of migrants from, from Central America through Mexico to North America. In fact, we will get to Monica later, who is also a speaker today, but we organized with the Association of uh, Spanish Scientists in Belgium, a wonderful activity on, on also from a scientific, there can always be a scientific approach to everything. Uh, and, and we dealt with this issue of, of refugees and forced migration, etc., uh, from the perspective of mental health, which is something that sometimes has been overlooked. What happens with these uh, traumatized people? We think of feeding them of, of very basic needs, but then there's obviously a, 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 a trauma that's there. And we talked with specialists, etc. So anyway, this is just to give you a few examples of what we do. All these initiatives you're telling us about, uh, uh, we would be happy to participate, to fund. We have a, a, a small uh, a budget, but we, 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 we are growing and, and we have this open call every fall um, in October for the following year. That's called Ventanilla Abierta, Open Locket, uh, uh, Guichet Ouvert. Uh, and you can go on our website and, and, and please uh, and share your project whenever you're ready. So now 
as I said, we're getting ready. Hold on tight. We're traveling all the way back to Spain. I think we're going to Barcelona again. Is that it, Sandra? Uh, Barcelona, now Madrid, but yeah. Okay. Whatever. Madrid, I'm from Barcelona, exactly. so it's okay. All the better, then we cover more <laughs> ground. So, and I'm very honored to, to introduce Sandra Ortonoves, better known for those of us who follow her, have known her, we're so excited she's with us, La Hiperactina. She's uh, amongst us. We had a variety, as you can see, of science communicators. We had to have someone, uh, a YouTuber, as they call it, no? uh, uh, at this milieu, because I think it's it's a very special one. And, and, and Sandra is, in her own right, a biomedical scientist and creator of this of this channel of La Hyperactina. And, and uh, we will let her explain it much better than we can. But she has, all, obviously, with all the thousands of followers that she has, she's been able to, to talk about things uh, as, as dramatic as cancer, others more uh, our day to day as, you know, for example, the effect uh, that coffee has on our body. And, and, and she's been able to, to get the attention, of, especially of a, of a younger audience that I know from experience, not from being young, but from, from my children, uh, where they, in fin, in fin, enfin, they spend, uh, they, they're really, their attention span, and, and I, don't see it, I don't see it as a criticism, is that there's so many interesting things out there that I'm marveled at the fact, you know, that they're able to, to just focus on many things, but a very small period of time. And that's a challenge for those of us, uh, you know, who are different generations. So, Sandra, without further ado, uh, bienvenida, bienvenida. We're honored to have you here. Tell us about La Hyperactina and give us some examples. And thanks for being here. Thank you. No, thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here and sharing space with these amazing people. Um, I also prepared a very short presentation. Can I can I share screen? I think so. Do you see my screen now? Yeah, right. Okay. So I will. Okay, so this is me. Well, this is an emoji, but it represents myself. I'm, I'm Sandra Ortonoves Lara. I'm the creator of Playpractin, as you said, a science communication project that aims to make people understand how their human body works in case they're humans, right? So um, my educational background, which is really important to understand how I ended up uh, being here, is, uh, is this one. I, I studied biomedical sciences. Uh, for those who are watching this and don't know what biomedicine is, biomedicine is a branch of science that tries to understand the human's body function and structure, basically, or what, what are the causes behind disease, or how can we study diseases or treat them, right? And right after I finished my, I finished studying this degree, I also studied a master in, in medical, scientific and environmental communication because I really wanted to, to do science communication. And yeah, after I finished my master, I, I decided to start my own science communication project. And specifically, I, wa I wanted to, to explain biomedicine, right? To make people know what biomedicine is, to make people understand how, how does the human body work? So this is how Lyperactina, which is the name of, of this project, started. Actually, Lyperactina started being a YouTube channel. So this is how the YouTube channel looks like today. Uh, well, three or four days ago when I took this screenshot. And yeah, you might see here like a lot of videos on different topics, right? But of course, this YouTube channel uh, began with few videos. And these videos were about really general topics, right? Because I, I, I was a little bit afraid of talking about two scientific videos. I don't know if, if, if you understand, but it's, it's basically, I was doing videos on um, how does coffee wake us up or why do we dance or what is gluten? How does celiac disease work, right? So very general topics. But after some time, I started doing videos on more, more hard, on harder topics, I would say, such as CRISPR-Cas9, right? So this gene editing tool, or what is epigenetics? What are prions, these lethal proteins that can infect one's brain and destroy it, basically? So really, really scary. And I realized that people were actually interested in science. So I was underestimating my audience. I was like, no, I will explain how like how does coffee work, right? But suddenly I was talking about epigenetics and this video had more views than the other one. So I, I realized people are actually interested in science and young people are also interested in science because as I will tell you later, my audience is mainly 
young people and teenagers. And yeah, so very soon, La Hiperactina stopped being just a YouTube channel, and I was invited to present some events, uh, to go and talk in different scientific programs. Uh, I did scientific uh, monologues as well, not as good as Big Bang Fiendi, of course, but I tried to. And also I was invited to talk on the radio on different podcasts. So it, 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 was, it was growing bigger, right, this project. And I also started sharing science in different social media because this social media world is so, is so big and there are so many different channels and every channel has its specific format and specific audience. So I, I started sharing content not only on YouTube, but also on Instagram, on Twitter, on Twitch, which is this new streaming platform, on TikTok, which is also a new social media platform. And yes, yeah, so it, it began to, to grow. And, and one year ago now, I, I published my first book, my first and only uh, last one for now <laughs> book, which is called um, Que Puede Salir Mal, which in Spanish means what could go wrong, how to survive in a world that tries to kill you. And it might be a really dramatic title. It, the book is not so dramatic. So it tries to explain how our body is uh, constantly surviving to all the damages it's receiving, right? So the, the sunlight, uh, mutations, cancer. So how do we survive uh, the, um, every day, right? So it's a basic introduction to biomedicine, human body for those who want to, to learn a, a, lit, a little bit more about it. And so the final conclusions would be that my, my main goal is that anyone who wants to understand how the, it, his or her body works um, can, can do it, right? Or I, I also want to explain the latest advances in medicine so that anyone can understand them. Also, with, you know, with time, I realized that my, my audience is mainly young people. They are teenagers. Most of them are in the age to decide uh, what they want to study and, and or maybe also people who are actually studying something related to biological sciences. And yeah, and they watch my videos to study, for instance, right? And, and they often also write me to, to tell me that they, like, mm, by watching my videos, they realize they really like biomedicine and they actually want to study biomedicine, no? So this is also a really, a really nice advantage of having a YouTube channel. And basically, I think disseminating science through social media channels has a positive effect on young people's interest in science because young people live already in social media. So if we can also use this uh, channel to disseminate science and to make science be there, this is really positive for, for everyone. And that's basically the, the aim of Lyperactina, like, to be there and to make science people closer to science. So that's basically it. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And I have, well, I have tons of yes. questions and then we'll please... Uh, well, I will stop sharing my, my yeah. screen. I don't know how to do it, but... It's okay. No, I think okay. Well, it doesn't... Well, I will leave it like this. You'd like yeah, to tell know, me. Maybe Jessica can help you. That's I nice too. You got it? I so. There yes. you go. So thank you, Sandra. I, wa I wanted to ask you, uh, 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 well, many questions, but on YouTube specifically, what, how do you decide to, to become a YouTuber? When I mean you're also generationally, that's something that, that maybe it's more familiar to you than it would be maybe to to other people. Uh, uh, but but how do you make that choice? Because yeah, we are scientists, but that doesn't mean we're trained as 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 and not only communicators, but you know this is a very specific uh, uh, you know milieu, a very specific channel. How do you make that reach? And do you do it all by yourself, or do you have do you work with with a team or with other people who are experts on this sort of communication? If you can tell us a bit about the yeah, right. process. That uh, you I wish they had a team actually, because you know, the, the project is growing bigger and I, I'm alone trying to, oh, wow. you know, to, to make everything. But, but of course, as the project is growing, I really need people to help me. So I will start hiring someone very soon because it's too much work. So yeah, I, I you know, as you said, it's, it's something generational, right? So when I was young, I remember when I was maybe 16 years old, I, I watched YouTube videos that helped me study. So if I had to, to I don't know, to study what DNA is or um, something about physics, I, I would watch YouTube videos because I felt 
that if I if I could see it, I would understand it better. Um, so that was basically I, I I used a lot of YouTube to to study, and that's something that I don't know. It it was a part of me, so I, I really liked this platform, and I really thought this platform is really useful and interesting to share science because as, as I said, I I might. I can try to explain you what DNA is, right? But if you see it in an image, it's like so obvious. It's like you can, you can actually um, see it. So I really liked YouTube too. And I thought it was really interesting to explain science. And also because, you know, it feels, this YouTube format feels generally so close, right? So if, for instance, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm watching a TV program on science. So everything is so serious and i don't know how to how to say it but it, in a youtube video in the end i'm a young person who's in her room and he's you know he's he's explaining something that is it's usually not accessible to those people right so maybe i'm talking about epigenetics and i'm just a girl in her room and i'm and this feels so close that it allows you to connect better with your audience and that's also something I really liked about, about YouTube. About the space. And I know, and as you said, now we, of course, you cannot do without and you should not do without when educating our, you know, uh, these new generations, because why, who would not take advantage from such a wonderful no, instrument? Mm. And I know that, for example, my, my, my children, I'm sorry, I'm reverting to my personal experience, <laughs> no, but I know. Uh, and it's happening to me more and more. We don't just watch TV, you know? We come from a generation where we, as you said, we sat there and there's a set program. They, they're on YouTube, but many of us, you know, you find tutorials, et cetera. But I have, I have this debate with, with colleagues and with uh, my kids and, and, their, and their friends about, um, because they're having to learn at a very young age. There's so much out there that's, uh, before it was all very structured, and this is what you have to study, this is your syllabus, this is a science program uh, on, on public TV or whatever. So they have a big responsibility to choose, no? And I wanted to ask you about this challenge. Everything you do on YouTube uh, it can go so viral. Everything, they have all these eyes and ears on you. And I wanted to ask you that, uh, you know, is, is that a concern? Is it something, how do you think of the contents? Are you careful about certain things that you can say or not? I mean, how does that work uh, when you know that you actually have that influence, that power to influence people, as you said, that are uh, still young, trying to make up their minds about what to do? And I wonder if you if you battle with that sometimes, or if it's an issue at all. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's such a big responsibility. Sometimes I feel like I'm I'm not aware like how many people actually see what I'm doing all the time. And well, actually they're writing you all the time and telling you, so I watch this video. And so everything you do is, it has so many eyes on it that you have to be really careful about everything. So of course I really try to, to make really elaborated videos. So I, I'm, I do not turn on the camera and start speaking, never. So I always have, a script behind that has a lot of work also behind a, maybe two weeks of um you know reading papers and looking for information so i'm i'm really careful about how my videos are like my 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 video content but also how how i explain it also as you said i i explain really um dramatic um, topics such as cancer for example right so when you're talking about diseases even if I try to use humor in my videos, because I, I think that's something as Big Bang Cynthia has said, right? It's, it makes you closer to your audience. I really try to, to be funny and to, to use humor, but also you have to be careful because you are, you're explaining really delicate topics. And, and yeah, it's such a big challenge to, to make. I mean, you can do everything right all the time because you're a human being, right? But I really try it, and I'm I'm really aware of all this responsibility you have. If it, it, it's not your choice, because actually you you upload videos and and you don't know whether they will you know success and have have a lot of views or not, or you know or it will yeah it will go right or not. So it's not your choice. But once actually your your channel is growing bigger and you have a lot of eyes on you, you have to be really careful and and. You're actually, even if you don't want to, you're kind of a role model because they, they're watching you and they want to do the same as you do and you have to be really careful. So yeah, it's a big responsibility. 
Wow, and I, I and you, I'm impressed because you're present in most of the uh, 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 different tools and different networks. So I wanted to ask because you have, you said you study, and, and of course it's, it's so helpful because of course if you're studying or trying to, you you spare us a lot of work. You've done all this reading, you've done all this preparation. You're an expert yourself, and you kind of tailor it uh, so that in a few minutes you're you're able to get a, a general idea. But how uh, do you work the on the same content, how do you adapt it then to, for example, Twitch, which is a different, you know, like live streaming? How do you deal with uh, uh, TikTok, which is so different? I mean, I guess, do you do you use TikTok to then relate to your other sources where you have more time or different platforms? I, I'm just curious how you manage to be so yeah. active on all these different networks at the same time. Yeah, that is also a challenge and it's also such a you know, this world is changing all the time. So what like Peractina started being a YouTube channel and I thought that would be it, right? But then suddenly there's Twitch and everyone's on Twitch and you also want to be on Twitch because you want to try it. And suddenly there's TikTok and they're so different. So yeah, as you said, Twitch for instance is a, is a streaming platform. So that means I can be talking about something for an hour or two and that's okay. So maybe there's not like a lot of work behind like a preparation work behind i can actually turn on my camera and say hey let's read today news on science and i start reading news and you know and people on the chat are actually making suggestions comments questions right um but that's more like um and you have a longer time to do it uh, for instance, TikTok, it, you just have one minute to, to explain exactly. something. So, of course, I can't actually. So, what does TikTok um, do in people? So, what is it useful for? For me, TikTok, it's more like a, like a hook for people, right? So, TikTok um, helps you to make, you know, people interested in something. So, for instance, if I want to make people interested in, I don't know, how does lung cancer work, for instance? So I, I might use really uh, attractive images and really interesting, you know, but I, I have really a short time. So my my aim, my objective is to make them feel interested in that topic so that they later go to my YouTube channel or whatever to, to actually, you know, learn more about it. Because in one minute, you, you don't have like a lot of time to do it. It is useful, for instance, to actually um, comment the latest advances in, in medicine, for instance. Sometimes I say, uh, with all this uh, pandemic uh, going on, I sometimes I used also TikTok to, in one minute, to uh, explain like uh, news on, on this, uh, on the coronavirus research. And that's also useful, but you know, every platform is so different from the other. And, and the same content, even if you, if you've prepared like a video in YouTube, you can't use the same, you know, video to TikTok. You have to adapt it. I can't just take one minute from this YouTube video and upload it on TikTok. That doesn't really work. I mean, you really have to adapt your content to this platform because every platform is so different. So listen, I have, we have a couple of questions for you as well on the chat. And, ah, and right. yeah, so if you, uh, let me just read this because there's a couple. And there's one that's sure. a big fan of yours. And, and, and basically, he or she is asking how you see the future of science communication on YouTube. Because it's lately people started to leave YouTube because apparently the algorithm, yeah. uh, that's and again, <laughs> science, does not like science that much. So in the end, you know, uh, and there's all this monetization issue. So tell us a bit about it, if you have a position on that. Yeah, Please. right, no, what, what's a topic to talk about? I could be talking for an hour about this. <laughs> uh, no, of course, um, YouTube in the end is a, is a business model, right? So its algorithm will, will always um, help all this content that's, um, that will easily go viral, but also that it, that would not talk about um, how the controversial topics, right? For instance, I my my example always is the same. So I, I did this video on um, on cannabis because a lot of my audience is young people and they would ask me a lot about can you do it a video can you do a video on cannabis? Is it really bad to smoke it? Um, you know what are the health risks, etc. So I, I, and it was the hardest video I ever made because uh, there were so different papers and I really had a hard time trying to select the right information and, and reading a lot to understand everything and et cetera. 
and after all this work, it was like two or three weeks uh, work only on the video. Um, yeah, I uploaded the video and YouTube, you know, put a lot of restrictions on it. So it was like the monetization was blocked, which means that, that I would earn no money at all for all my work. Um, it put a restriction, an age restriction, which meant only only people like um, 18 plus uh, age could see that video, which is is pointless because I made that video for all these young people who really need to know that smoking cannabis is so dangerous for them, right? And then YouTube didn't help me with with my um, with this, and it is so frustrating all the time. And you know, and, and this is a problem that starting that that was yeah that was uh, repeated a lot of times. So. I made this video about insomnia. So I was basically from a health point of view. So I was explaining people what insomnia is, when you should go and get some help if you couldn't sleep, et cetera. And also YouTube put restrictions like the, the monetization was turned off, um, et cetera. So I've, I've been having all these problems with the platform. So of course, YouTube is, is wonderful and it's so nice. Um, you know, and uh, science YouTube video is really nice and everything. But behind all this, behind this algorithm, um, there's this fight with, you know, all, all creators we're fighting against the algorithm all the time, trying to, I don't know, to make our, our content reach more people. But if the algorithm doesn't help us because the, it, it considers that your content is controversial. And I, I repeat, I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about drugs sometimes. I'm talking about sexual education. And it doesn't reach uh, that much people because the algorithm considers it is so controversial that it doesn't want to reach that much people. So it's a bit pointless, right? So yeah, there's a constant fight that we we really hope we will win someday, but here we are. So that's also why we're actually trying on tweets, on TikTok. So we, I don't want to be in the set platform only because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So just in case mm -hmm. i'm trying to adapt to all the platforms existing platforms because i don't know where i i will be tomorrow okay maybe that's i know that's not your field it's not biomedicine but uh, you know i'm puzzled as i i wish we could capsize sometimes youtube airlines websites to see what algorithms are behind there you know and yeah. who is behind these algorithms it's not just the mathematicians of course, that, yeah that is, and you know because we we realize it's we are all it's basically everything is that we do online is is uh, uh or digitally is, is linked to an algorithm which yep. in turn uh, reflects the views or the prejudices etc of, of of all the people so yep, last totally. question for you uh yep. sandra before we move on and it's uh someone is asking uh, how uh, all the way from from Mexico City. How do you yeah. stay motivated to create a new video topic? I mean, having several interest, in, different topics in science. How do you choose your content to stay? Because it shows that you're always excited about what you're saying. But how can you be, you know, excited about every single thing? How do you choose your topics? There are so many interesting topics uh, I can talk about. That you know, there, yeah, there's a lot of them. Usually, I people help me, you know, choose what what the next uh, video topic will be. So usually, I make polls through my social media, like what would you like to see in the next video, or what questions do you have on biomedicine, etc. Right. So I I make this combination between what I feel like doing at that moment because that, that's really uh, important if you want to stay motivated of doing a video. It is uh, really important that you have a real interest in that topic, right? Because it helps me a lot on the storytelling, on the script, on when I have to record the video, et cetera. And also with my audience, they are all the time constantly um, asking for new content and asking for different topics. So I, I, they really help me uh, have a, having a lot of topics to talk about. There's biomedicine is so extensive, so big that you can talk about almost um, anything related to the human body, right? But, <laughs> but yeah. Thank you so much, Sandra. We're gonna Thank move on, guys. but stay with us. We'll have a few more minutes because I see more questions popping up, but then we'll 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 okay. we can we can go back to them uh, uh, during the Q and A. And now I have the pleasure to to introduce. Lisbeth Arts, who is a biomedical, also we stay with biomedicine, a biomedical scientist and science communication uh, communicator at the VIP KU Leuven here at the University of, of Leuven Center for Brain and Disease Research. 
and she's one of the heads of the Infopunt Prof Durendurzok and the Belgian SICOM network. And I'd like, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about those institutions and about yourself. We're very happy to have you with us, Lisbeth. Huida, welcome. Tell us. Sorry, I was still on mute. Thank you very much. And um, also very happy to be here and uh, to hear also from uh, colleague science communicators in Belgium and in Spain. It's been really an uh, interesting morning already. And so I'll take a few minutes also to introduce myself. You see my slide. So as uh, Sergi mentioned, uh, I'm indeed uh, actually very lucky to be uh, a paid science communicator at the research um, institute at uh, VIB and KU Leuven. And so that's um, actually a research center with about 300 people uh, over 16 different labs where I'm uh, responsible for all the communication. So whenever we do a press release or also the website, social media, um, contacts with patient organizations or if there are events like a science day, et cetera, um, I'm involved in all of that. So it's mainly uh, neurobiology and also um, yeah, neurodegenerative disease that I'm focused on. And then um, after hours, I don't know if this, yeah, after hours, um, uh, I'm still doing uh, more science communication. I have sort of um, by accident rolled into uh, an advocacy role on animal research in Belgium. I can, <clears throat> I can speak uh, to you in a bit more detail about that uh, uh, later. And then um, I am being a uh, trained as a researcher myself, <clears throat> sorry. So I, I studied uh, bioengineering, then did the PhD in biomedical uh, sciences on Parkinson's disease and a postdoc on dementia research and only then went into science communication. So 99% trained as a scientist and all of the communication skills I'm learning um, on the way and so I was lacking a good network of other science communicators in Belgium, which is why I started the meetup group and organized last year a Belgian Psychom network meeting for other people who are either professional science communicators or scientists who are very actively uh, involved also in science communication. Um, so yeah, this is just a picture in one of our labs to illustrate um, the work that I do there. I think um, uh, what I do, I always describe it uh, not simply as science communication, I mean my daytime job, but as public relations for academics. Um, I think it's, um, it's positive how in the last years um, we do see a real change even within academia itself and that there is slightly more incentive to be a good communicator. I think uh, in the way it's balanced, I mean there's still a lot of discussion, but I see a lot of scientists and institutes and departments um, becoming much more actively engaged and everyone realizes that it's not enough just to stay in the lab or in the ivory tower. A lot of funding bodies also ask for dissemination plans and communication plans and strategies that are tied to the funding. So I think that's that's really a, a good move and I'm really happy to be a part of that. And I have a slide to switch up some pictures on the second part that I mentioned, the animal resource, research. So this started um, by accident, as I mentioned, uh, for the people in Belgium, they may remember that I think now almost five years ago, uh, an undercover video uh, from an animal lab in Brussels surfaced uh, in which there was um, yeah, some controversial scenes, some unlawful actions, some very um, uh, lawful actions and handlings of animals. Um, but uh, the general public was really shocked to see this video. There was a lot of um, upheaval about animal research and, and you know it was brought uh, it's always sort of a, in the societal debate but it was brought uh, very much to, to the front uh, and center of the news and I was very frustrated that there was um, virtually no one standing up to at least try to explain you know why and when we do animal research why it's still necessary of course condone things that are uh, not following the rules which are there there are strict rules a lot of people think scientists just you know do whatever they like with animals which is of course uh, not true and so together with some other young scientists we found it's infoprint proof the underzoek which is a communication platform and there's a basic website and we are on social media and we try to um, sort of respond to miscommunication about animal research, but also just to provide information, um, you know, the numbers in Belgium, what kind of species, so that people who have questions about this 
uh, can find uh, some information. We wrote a little booklet also aimed at people in high school with, um, yeah, with the basics and, and the background and the policy uh, of animal research. And I felt that actually um, there is a huge need because we get a lot of calls actually also from journalists. So whenever there is something, um, uh, some study on animals or even now with Corona, with COVID, uh, there is some research in Belgium um, done on hamsters. Uh, and people are always curious to know then why hamsters and can't we do without, etc. And uh, apparently it's very tricky to find people um, who want to speak on camera or to the media about animal research. A lot of people are a bit shy to do it, but my experience has been actually quite positive. And I'm a firm believer that if, you, if you're open and transparent with the public and trust the public to make their own judgments, um, that's always the right move and not to hide away and think like, you know, we know best, let's not share it with, with the audience because they might get the wrong idea. I mean, they will definitely get the wrong idea if you're not open and transparent. And then thirdly, indeed, is the SciComm network. So as I mentioned, I was lacking actually a network with other science communicators. I think also specifically in Flanders and Belgium, this is very fragmented because we have the language divide uh, in Belgium, the different media setups, etc. I think if I look to the Netherlands or the UK, there's much more professional science journalism and science communication. I'm also super um, eager to learn more about like the landscape uh, in Spain, which I don't know that well, but um, I'm learning more about today. Um, so that's sort of the intro uh, as to my relation to science communication. And then if I can move on immediately to that series, I had like sort of three tips and lessons learned to share with you uh, from my experience. So the first one is, is to team up, especially if it's a controversial topic. Um, yeah, if you sort of get into the arena, sometimes it can get very exhausting and a lot and very time consuming if you interact with media. I, I've heard from Sandra that also, I mean, she's very successful and, and being on different platforms. And, and there's always, I think, a lot to do <laughs> and, and an unlimited amount of things to tackle. And um, you need to be strategic, I guess, about what you do first and what might have a big impact, but also to team up with like-minded people. I think that's the best advice for people starting out or not sure to begin. I think it's also what Ariana did with Soapbox Science. Okay, shall we do it in Belgium? Who's, uh, you know, who wants to join? How can we get this going? Because there's um, probably a lot more people um, who want to help you out. And the second thing that I always uh, tell other um, people who are new at science communication or thinking about science communication is sort of, uh, they have a fear of putting themselves out there and acting as the expert. I think in academia, especially, there is a lot of uh, imposter syndrome um, I see it very uh, clearly in the animal research debate where people are like, yeah, but I mean, I'm not speaking out. I mean, I'm, I'm only a PhD student or even professors who say, you know, I work with animals, but I'm not a specialist in animal research. I'm a neurobiologist who works with animals. And so there's always someone more senior or more uh, experienced or a, a bigger specialist to point to. And then in the end, no one speaks up. So I think uh, people under, underestimate um, what they already know and I think also the capabilities they have. I think also maybe again to uh, give Sandra as an example who is passionate about biomedicine but obviously doesn't know every paper of every topic by heart but who has the skills and does you know when she does a video on one thing will go and read the papers and has a, exactly the skill to then translate it right. If she would say each time well you know but cannabis I'm not a cannabis researcher um, nothing would happen because the cannabis researchers are not making these uh, fantastic uh, YouTube movies, right? So I think trust yourself um, and, and, and know that you are already an expert, to, especially to a large part of your audience. And then the third sort of tricky one for me in, in, uh, in the difficult debate um, is that also, I guess we're sort of biased as scientists to think very rational and to think that facts um, and throwing facts and information at people will help them change their minds. I think this is also something that all of the speakers alluded to, um, that this connection, this human connection, the way people see scientists is very, uh, very important. So I think it's very much okay to, I mean, I don't know if getting emotional is really the right word, but to put a face on there to show also why you believe in something or that you maybe also have doubts, why things are tricky and step away from this, um, you know, knowledge uh, pushing type of communication, uh, because um, especially when it comes to controversial topics, I mean, animal research is one example, but also GMOs or, or other, I mean, could even indeed be cannabis or other 
things that you know there are different views about i mean there's the science and there's scientific facts but then what you do with it as a society is of course uh, a bit broader so really try to do more than just uh, share the facts these were three short tips uh, related to my experience and i'm happy to to discuss further with uh, with all of you today thanks thank you so much this this is wonderful how you're able to wow to synthesize all, all of this and and how your own work led you to become a, a, a an animal rights activist you know within the lab that's very interesting i have again many questions but one in particular because this is a debate we've had and I, i've heard uh, colleagues you know who are scientists who've decided to uh because in fact you have to make a choice you cannot continue 100 doing your research and be a communicator and i'm, I'm wondering uh, what effect that has on your colleagues on on your uh, when you're explaining for them for example what's happening in in your field and and how they they feel about that i think many of us have discovered epidemiology for example as a field because of of corona uh you know the in fact we've had a very sad case in belgium uh that made the international media about uh, actually an epidemiologist whose life was threatened and his family because of 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 all this um you know this extreme uh, political views so this anyway I'm, i'm asking you to reflect on this and also on on how hard you, you you said that's very poignant that facts don't change you know that that people's beliefs and all this uh all these po political or to call it something positions on, on on that resist any sort of argument any sort of communication i guess must be a, a an amazing challenge for you so my question first how one becomes goes from science uh you know as a researcher to communication and what effect that has in colleagues and also this issue of uh of of, of you know more political issue of how how to transcend how do you really get to those people who do not want to be uh you know do not want to receive this communication uh, uh science communication thank you lisbeth yeah uh so that's a lot of questions in one but um um i think in my case indeed i switched like 100 i'm a professional science communicator uh, and i'm not at the, at the bench anymore i'm not you know pipetting or doing experiments myself but i do think i mean there's a whole spectrum i think um we should definitely encourage people who are scientists to devote some of your that time to 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 do outreach and to interact with other people so that's definitely definitely valuable and okay i've noticed that some people are hesitant that you know what their colleagues might think so my advice there would be to find a supervisor or a boss um who encourages uh you in this endeavor i mean scientists are not they don't fit into one mold some will be better communicators some will be not so good at it naturally some people will like to do it others not Uh, and I think that's fine, and I think everyone should get uh, get this opportunity. But I do think that communicating will also help you as a scientist yourself. Uh, for me, switching 100%, um, well, I guess that's a bit more clear in that sense uh, on what people expect you to do. Um, but I think there, I mean, um, uh, it's not to be underestimated how much value then the scientific background does have in in this job. So I think actually this the the there's a whole I mean there's a whole spectrum between black and white between pure scientist and pure communicator, and they all have their value. So I think the more we have a mix uh, and understand each other and again team up, that will be useful. And then to get to your comments on the on the politics and and, and indeed the tension. So first of all talking about animal research because of course you know when i for the first time wrote an opinion piece being you know well pro animal research is, not, is never the term i use because no one is pro animal research but but underscoring um the need still for animal research i was also a bit um you know afraid uh, about the reactions i might get but all in all it's been super super positive i had to i have once blocked one person on twitter and that's it For the rest, um, I mean, there's no personal threats or anything. So it's, I mean, there's nothing to be really as scared of. I think um, going into a dialogue is, 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 is I mean, the, the more people do it, the easier it also is because you sort of, you, I mean, nobody wants to become the, you know, the ambassador or the, the punch ball. Um, so I think the more we are, you know, the stronger we are. And um And then one thing I think is important also uh, to what you touched about, um, you know, these people that you might never convince, uh, you know, that, that won't listen anyway, or that, that have made up their minds. I think it's important also in, in controversial issues to know that actually 
um, the extremes are always the minority. So again, when it's about animal research, um, if you go out of the street and you ask people about animal research, the people who would be like, you know, scientists are awful. I think it's uh, horrible. They should lock them all up because they use animals. I mean, these are very, very, very few people. And there are a lot of people who say, yeah, I mean, I hope, I mean, I, I'm against uh, torturing animals. I don't want anyone to abuse animals. And if scientists do use animals, I mean, I hope they know what they're doing or do they know what they're doing? There's a, I mean, there are a lot of people who, who don't think uh, every day or every week or even every year about actually, you know, what is animal research and is it a good or a bad thing or a necessary thing? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's for those people that you also communicate that when they do have a question that the only information that they find is not from, from the extreme end, even on either side. That's what we want to achieve with Infoprint Proof the Ondersoek. We don't campaign for people to, to support animal research. We want to provide information, numbers on which species, uh, um, information about the regulations in the EU, outside the EU, about alternatives, what has changed in the last 10 years or not, and then people can make up their own minds. So I think, um, yeah, try not to focus maybe on the on the one percent uh, hardcore, but on, on all of those people in in the in the middle zone. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisbeth. So now uh, we are to kind of end our our, our round of uh, of presentations. Uh, I'm very happy to have. In fact, we asked her to come on board as a discussant, Monica Vara, who is uh, head of the science communication of of Spanish scientists in in Belgium. She has a PhD degree in biomedical sciences. So we have another another biomedical scientist, uh, uh, cancer from Kauleuven, Belgium, and she's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the VIB uh, in Brussels, the, the university here in Brussels. And we collaborate a lot with, the, with the, this association of Spanish scientists, with Tevez, so they're like our partners. I said, well, it'd be interesting, Monica, if you can come on board and Tell us about Thebe and also tell us via discussion and help us, you know, wrap it up also with some uh, reflections or questions you might have and how we can move further also this networking, which I think is so useful. Uh, we, there's, I think there's about 3,000 or so sci Spanish scientists spread around the world that you have formed an actual federation that's called uh, Raithex, uh, and and that's it's a, it's become a lobby if I can say that not from the and we can feel that and I think it's very interesting a, a critical lobby as lobbies should be uh, uh, you know to defend positions of of, of Spanish scientists in in a broad uh, array of issues. So Monica, buenos días y, y gracias por estar aquí. Buenos días, muchas gracias por invitarme. La verdad es que fue una una sorpresa. Oh, sorry, I switched to English. I just got carried away. So it uh, was truly a surprise to get invited. I mean, I know all of you as science communicators and the fact that I can be on the same level, that already makes uh, makes me wonder that we've done something good with Tebe Science Communication. So Tebe was born in 2017, as Lisbeth said, uh, as a way to team up because of course you're Spanish, you're in a foreign country, you're doing science, but you're alone. So isn't it better to actually have a support team that you can discuss? We all have questions. Some of us want to go back, some of us won't, but still we are living here and we are also together with a Belgian community. And uh, we also know that uh, science is not just about us being locked up in a lab with a lab coat and that's it. No, science is much more. Science is also industry. Science is policy in the parliament and these are equal scientists. And we should all uh, have a bit of visibility. And that's the whole power of science communication because eventually science communication is transmitting science to public. And I'm just going to bring up the word that has been implicit in all your words, but uh, in all your talks, but no one has uh, mentioned that is passion. So eventually, if you're a scientist by training, you're driven by passion of knowledge. And I think that if you can communicate to people on that passion level, that that's actually even a more powerful connection than humor, because you're also putting yourself at the same level. And that's with those passionate scientists that we have in Belgium, that's what we're trying to give them the opportunity. Because as Lisbeth already said, 
giving uh, communicating is scary like you are very comfortable among your privates among in your lab but then actually telling to the real world what you're doing is hard and it's not the same explaining to your cousin of five year old or your grandma of 80 year old what are you doing why did you move out to another country why can't you do it here and that's the the purpose of our platform of science communication is bring up knowledge in a lot of variety of topics climate change cancer uh, quantum computers anything that we can have bringing experts but also is give the opportunity to the scientists here to show what they are doing but it's a scary you know like uh, not everyone as Lisbeth said there's to put themselves on the tv or like sandra does in youtube at first, but it needs small nudges. So we also give them the opportunity to do that. Why? We have collaborations uh, with uh, different radio stations. We also have uh, started a blog. We also give them the opportunity to talk with science communicators, to follow trainings, to really give them bit by bit those nudges, because eventually we believe that it's also the role as scientists, not just science communicators, to really bring all the wonderful science that we are doing in the lab, in the commission, in the companies, everything, and just bring it to the society in a way that they can understand. And that's uh, in a very, in, in a very short way, what we are doing and what we are trying and by establishing collaborations. And uh, if you have always suggestions, we are always very open. We might be shorthanded, but that doesn't, uh, make us less relentless to really share our our science. And uh, yeah, that's uh, basically us. Uh, Sergio, I cannot hear you. Sorry, no, I was thanking you. Thank you, thank you, because uh, yeah, passion. You said it and, 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 I, and shorthanded, which is good. I think that goes hand in hand with passion and we find out we're always involved deadlines because we do more by definition passionate people do more than sometimes that, that they can really you know they do physically you know uh, because it's that's the nature of passion and i am very glad you brought it up because without passion none of us would be here and none of us would be doing things that are easier that are more nine to five that are more so that's something that we probably all share and uh, listen any any questions you might have anyone we, i've been asking questions because i know in the end there's always little time but any comments because we're we're almost it's 12 30 but we can run a few a couple of minutes late monica por favor please yes i actually have a question because uh, one of the problems that we face is language so we are scientists in Spain, so we do science communication in Spanish, English, but then of course Belgium has French, Dutch, that it's uh, they are languages we are scared a bit to jump in. So what is the importance of language for science communication? And I think that the, the variety of speakers can really give us a very nice uh, overview on this topic. Thank you. That's a great, great question. It's a challenge for all of us in multilingual societies. So please, Anyone, I don't know, Christine, uh, uh, any, especially the Belgian colleagues. <laughs> maybe Ariana? Yeah, maybe yeah, Ariana. Ariana and Christine, oh. please. Ariana, go ahead. In, uh, in Softbox Science, we, we are giving the presentation in uh, three different languages. So we choose uh, French, Dutch, and English. But the idea is really to be on the main square or on the street. So and speakers as a researcher are coming from everywhere in the world. We have, uh, I think this, this year we have uh, also Italians and Spanish. I think we have last year, it's a bit from everywhere. And so, for example, in Place de la Bourse in Brussels, you also meet a lot of tourists and people from everywhere. So the idea is really also to improvise and to be ready to, to give their speech in their own language, in, in different languages, to switch from one to another. And so trying to be as much as diverse as possible. I think it's very important if you want to, you, you, you have to, uh, to remove barriers and the language is one of the barriers. So you have to go to the people and to tell their, their own language if, if, if it's possible. That's right. How about Lisbeth, do you have any thoughts? Because you, you communicate mostly in Dutch, no, in Netherlands and in English. Is that correct or no? Or not? Yes. 
Yes, that's correct. So it's just my own uh, limited <laughs> language set. Uh, but I think indeed it, it depends on your audience. Um, and I think there also is again the value of teaming up to get to more languages. Um, I think as, as I mean, I as a scientist, at least I'll speak for myself, I underestimated for a long time um, I mean, the availability of good information for, for uh, non-experts, um, if at least there, I mean, there's Wikipedia in English, but the, the pages in, in Dutch are limited, etc. cetera. Um, if you have a big, I mean, I think Spain is still a, a, a huge um, language. I, don't, I mean, like in terms of numbers and around the globe, if I look at the, the, uh, the numbers of viewers also for, uh, for Sandra's YouTube, uh, I think in Flanders, I mean, that, I mean, well, it's still possible, I guess, <laughs> that would be even more impressive uh, because the, the language area is so small and there, is, uh, there are so few resources. I see this often also when talking to patients. So I've done also a lot on Parkinson's disease because that was my, my PhD in. And then I think, you know, the Michael J. Fox Foundation in the States, they have this huge resources, good explainers, videos, podcasts, but, you know, average, um, Patients here in Flanders uh, and their carers who are, I mean, 50, 60, 70 years old, they ca can't find their way to these things. And so I think um, it, it goes again to this, this aspect that I also wanted to stress that you are an expert and what you say is valuable and that there is so much information out there that we often think, you know, we don't need to add to it. But a lot of it is inaccessible for, so, for sure in journals because of the language and the, the, the paywall, etc. But also in terms of the format. Um, so I think the more we reframe it in different languages and in different formats and in different media, um, the reach will always uh, will grow. So I think, yeah, the more languages you speak or as a group or communal, that, the better it will be. And, and if I may travel to, to, to Spain with this question, and since we have, I don't know if Sandra actually is a Catalan speaker, but I know Elena and you are too, no? So uh, Elena and Uriol, do you, is, is, and Catalan, you know, that would be more of a similar situation as, as, as Dutch, you know, a, a more minority language. It, did you make a choice or do you make a choice, especially you, Peractina, who have a, uh, and, and, and what happens when you switch languages, you know, because uh, that's also a different audience as well. And, and, and at the same time, English is a lingua franca, but hey, we may be preaching to the choir too much because sometimes the people we want to reach out to may not necessarily speak this globish, this international English or English at all. So I'm wondering in the case of Catalan and Spanish, if you have any issues or even English, uh, and if that's been a, an issue for you, uh, choosing what language, you know, Sandra, for example, and then we'll go to, to Elena and, and Nuriel, please. Yes, uh, for instance, I'm also bilingual. I speak uh, Catalan and Spanish and well, English, but of course my native languages are uh, Catalan and Spanish. And when I had to decide um, in which language I wanted to communicate, I think I chose Spanish because I felt like I could reach more people. It, it was basically like that. Um, that was the, the main reason. Of course, if I sometimes I do um, science communication in Catalan and I love it, but but of course it, it just reaches people from from um, Catalonia, right? Or native speakers, Catalan native speakers. And for me that was a for me that was a limitation. So that's the reason I felt like if I I communicate in in Spanish. I could also reach people from um, Latin America, which are like 80% of my audience, 70% of my audience. That's a lot of people. That's what um, Lisbeth said, actually, that, that you know, these numbers uh, come also from, you know, different countries, not only Spain. And that was the reason. I mean, and then you could ask me, okay, so why don't you do it in English, you know, because there's even more people speaking English in the world. But I, for me, it is so important that you feel really comfortable with the language um, you're speaking. Of course, I, I don't have any problems speaking English. Um, I, I spoke English better some years ago, but, but yet for me, it's so important to feel, you know, it makes me feel confident when I'm, I'm speaking in my native language. For me, it comes so easily. I, I, can, I can do this storytelling so, so much better and, you know, all the examples also. I feel like I communicate better. So for me, it was this balance between I want to reach as much people as possible, but I also want to feel comfortable with, with the language I'm, I'm speaking, right? That's so that, right. Was, that, was right. The, that was it. That's right. That's always, you know, for those of us who are 
you know, who are here as diplomats or, or expats, it's always a, a big issue, you know, uh, because we cannot, it's hard to be proficient and we haven't even mentioned German. German is also an official language of Belgium, uh, but it's really hard for us to, uh, we communicate, for example, in French, uh, Spanish and, and Dutch, but it's always a challenge, you know, when you translate it, very few of us are proficient. I think that, as you said, one important condition that you feel have to feel comfortable in the language, because a lot of people, we think we speak English and sometimes we realize, well, uh, humor is a very difficult thing, passion. Yeah. So, you know, we may be okay for a webinar for, you know, communicate, but when you're trying to go beyond, that's, 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 that's can be a challenge. So I totally hear that it's still a challenge for us what to do. Sometimes it's more practical to just do English because in Brussels, that is the, the lingua franca, uh, even between Dutch and, 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 and French speakers, because it's the more politically correct, let alone all the people who live in Brussels, half of the inhabitants of uh, Brussels or more were not born in Belgium. So it's really, it's really interesting study case here, you know, and it's always a challenge for us and we don't really have an answer. So Elena and, and Uriol, what, what, is, what are your thoughts? Do you, because you work with schools in Catalonia and there's uh, linguistic immersion. So Catalan is the, the vehicular language and how do you, how do you? Totally. Yeah. Totally. So in this educational project, we speak both Spanish and Catalan. Of course, if we are trying to communicate science and the first thing that we think is we need, we need to use their language. We need to get rid of technicism and we, of course, you have to speak the language of the people. They, they have to have the minimal effort to understand you. You have to do the effort for them. So the language should be the language that they speak. In the educational projects inside the classroom, we have to speak mainly or Spanish or Catalan. Uh, the good thing here in Catalonia is, uh, I, I, I can say all of the people that speak Spanish, uh, that speak, sorry, Catalan, understand Spanish. So you can do the, your project in Spanish and well, it, it works also in, in Catalonia. But yeah, speaking in English here in Spain, I think to do science communication is kind of useless because not a lot of people is proficient in English. So of course we, we do our communication in, in Spanish or, or Catalan. Yeah. I guess I'm working on Basque. Try to go to the Basque country. Yeah, try. That's right. Very good. Still not there, but working on it. Very good, very good. Listen, I think we're we're a bit over time, and and we we would go on forever. Before we we finish, let me just share two more questions uh, with you that you'll see on the screen. How experienced are you with science communication? You know, if uh, the audience can can answer that. And there was another question. Uh, as well, just take a few seconds and then we'll bring it in in a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll bring this to an end. And um, that's why we're getting the answers in. And the next question is, there, it'll pop up in a second. Would you be interested in attending or organizing webinars like this one? So we would we we would like for this not to be, you know, the uh, one and only uh, one shot. So uh, we will also share the results of this research. Before I end, actually wanted to end with a with a specific example of of how we deal with this language issue. Those of us who want to reach an international audience who are multilingual, one of the wonderful one I think one of the my favorite uh, activities or, or initiatives we've developed in science communication uh, with uh, Jessica Molina, who is sitting next to me, and uh, is, uh, is this series of podcasts that's called that you will find on, the, on our, here are the answers. You can see the results, by the way, of, of, the, of the answers. So we had a lot of people from Belgium uh, and, and Spain and then other countries, that's very interesting. Scientists, but uh, not scientists, 30%. So that's really, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So people who aspire to be scientists, former scientists, scientists, but then people who, who maybe thanks to, to you all will become scientists. So, uh, okay. And, 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 okay. So some of them, this is the question that we ask because of soapbox, exactly. 
So that's interesting. Yeah. Some people have had this experience. Very good. Very good. And then we have, um, uh, exactly. Uh, interesting. Also quite a mix. Limited, quite a mix. So that's good. That means there is appetite for, for more. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So most people would be. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. But it's so glad, as you said, Lisbeth, not to be afraid to ask, you know, and, and people, you know, and you don't, you don't, you know, if you ask, you should be honest and maybe expect, you know, something you don't want to hear. But that's when you're asking genuinely, that's what happens, right? So uh, I just wanted to share this very quick example on this podcast that we wanted to, that we produced, and it's called Ciencia con Alma, which means it's uh, science from the soul, something like, because it's, we did it jointly with the radio station Radio Alma. The, it's Brussels-based, and it broadcasts actually in Spanish and in other Romance languages. And it was called Radio Alma. We were looking at, at something we could do, and we did a series, you'll see it on, on our, again, it has a limitation that's in Spanish, but we made a decision to do it in Spanish because we, and we choose a lot of the Belgian colleagues that collaborate are, are Belgians, are Spanish speakers as well. Uh, but we, we conscientiously made that decision because we wanted to reach out also to, to Latin America to make, you know, to go well and beyond. But that was, and, and this is how I'm bringing now Jessica, come here. I know she's going to be a bit upset at me, but uh, Jessica Molina, who didn't want to, she's very uh, modest and very shy, come here. Jessica is a, is a, is a doctor uh, in... In biology, not yet, not, yet. not yet, but almost a doctor in bi biology, and she's been with uh, with us almost for a year. Jessica, in fact, today is her last day, and I'm sorry, I don't want to get emotional. And she, I wanted her to be here and 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 be a speaker because she has a. Uh, it's been very. It's an interesting experiment. We have this is a new scholarship program. We bring um, scientists into the embassies. You know, people who are scientists or who are interested in science communication, and and we've had a very for us it's, it's been like a like a small family here. We've been part of the same uh, bubble. They came in very hard circumstances, but for me it's been a true pleasure uh, to be with her. It's always we have these debates, and 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 it's so interesting. You know, that science diplomacy. We need a scientist to have science diplomacy. So. Jessica, I, I know you're gonna you're gonna get me for this, yeah. but I could not uh, have it any other way. I'm gonna let you uh, close the webinar, please, uh, and and you do it and take it away. And we're gonna really miss you, but we will be connected, okay? While well, you're in Spain, she's actually leaving tomorrow morning. So, Jessica, take it away. You the speed del webinario, por favor. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, this was really an experiment for me because. I am a, a scientist. I am biotechnologist, but uh, I was I was curious about science diplomacy, science, uh, science communication, and well, uh, with Sergi we we thought about this webinar and it was kind of an experiment outside the lab <laughs> for me. So thank you very much. Uh, I am delighted to to meet you all and. And yes, uh, uh, thank you, thank you. We'll be in touch. It was a pleasure. Thank you to all the followers, to all the speakers. We won't let you go so easily. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Networking, thank you passion. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So interesting. Adios, arrivederci. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. 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 Ahora me vas a pegar. <ríe> Qué bien.